Yes, very good. Yep. Just switch on the live stream if you get a message on on the screen. Apologies. Okay, no, that's all, that's all good. It, it won't uh, upset me too much. Okay, so um, we're going to look today at the effort program. I've just, I've just uh, titled it the effort program and its afterlives because, as Tina kind of outlined at the start at the introduction, you know, why why look at this now? Um, what what is its relevance beyond that? Is what <laughs> what is the significance of the effort program as handed down in history what do we what is our common understanding of it and how does that reflect uh, uh processes uh ideological developments debates uh, within the workers movement over the course of the last 130 years because obviously the experience of the effort program what it was at the time etc is not necessarily what we uh, uh view it and see it as as today there's a whole uh, historical transmission of uh, 130 years in between so um just a few uh outline of what uh, outline of what I'm going to do today um some brief historical and theoretical background in 1891 so the effort programs uh, was was agreed at the effort congress of the SPD uh, in 1891 uh, I look at the program Tina mentioned the minimum maximum uh, uh, approach I'll start with the maximum uh, program the, the theoretical section so called and then the, the minimum program, the practical section, again, so-called, these terms can be slightly misleading. So we have to be careful uh, and we will do, uh, be careful when we go through and unpack them. Uh, the significance of the effort program, both at the time and historically. Uh, and then I want to look at some of the afterlives and how controversies surrounding the effort program, whether we are consciously aware of it or not, um, feed into our political moment today, but also were significant within um, key developments within the workers' movement, ideological discussions within the development of the workers' movement at various junctures in in history. And I start with um, Engels, his uh, article he wrote on the effort program in 1891. It was first published in 1901. I look uh, briefly at Rosa Luxemburg and her discussion, her debate with Karl Kautsky in 1910, precisely over matters related pertaining to the effort program. Uh, and then I take a quick look at uh, uh, Kautsky and Lenin on the Airfoot program a bit later in 1917 to then finish with uh, a, a broader look of historiography, i.e. what I started with at the, the beginning of the talk is how our understanding of what the Airfoot program is, if even if we haven't even heard of it, um, what that reflects about what's happened in the intervening 130 years within our movement. Okay, um, apologies for the, the the block of text, um, but it, it, I'm just going to kind of go through the points here. Um, the first thing to be said, it shouldn't be uh, uh, confused with the Linker's program from 2011. I think uh, the Linker uh, thought, oh, this when it was deciding its new program, oh, we'll use the uh, the anniversary of 1891, 120 years uh, to uh, to um, decide a program, and um, yeah, it's certainly the, uh, of a completely different characters. We'll see. Uh, but 1891 is significant in terms of German socialism because it reflects uh, a point, a, a key changing point in a key turning point in in German history, where the anti-socialist laws, the, the the banning of the of, of, of German socialism, has come to an end, and we have a situation where a growing socialist movement is looking to assert itself, looking to um, give its party structures more definition. And to, as Kautsky puts it, uh, provide theoretical reflection or programmatic reflection of the theoretical uh, developments and gains it had made since the um, the infamous, I suppose, Gotha program of 1875, which is what the effort program replaces in 1891. And for Kautsky, for Engels, uh, the significance of Erfurt in the first instance is uh, lies in the fact that the program is reflective of the kind of programmatic ideas that Marx and uh, certainly Engels in the, the latter part of his life had been fighting for for some time. I know you've looked at the Parti Ouvrier in this series so far, so I won't go into that. But essentially, the Erfurt program is a kind of German version of the Parti Ouvrier program of 1880, which was penned by Marx and Engels, uh, but also is a product of a far uh, less known uh, program of Austrian social democracy called the Heinfeld program, uh, which was passed in 1889. Uh, and they have a common structure, etc., which we'll look at. But essentially, the, the discussions at Erfurt, which result in a, a seven-day discussion 
in the city of Erfurt, in the Kaiserzar, uh, in October 1891. Uh, there are There is a huge debate, not only on the uh, nature of the program and what it should do, etc., but also on the organizational aspects of the new party, which gets its name for the first time, the SPD, the SPD. And uh, that 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 protocol is is available. You can see the the little picture of it there. Unfortunately, it's still the case that the the speeches, the debates from that huge document of seven days of discussion, really have not been uh, treated at all, but by scholars in any serious way. They haven't been translated, um, and and that that's reflective of something which we may come back to later on. But just to give that kind of outline, I think is important. What's also worth mentioning, um, and this is actually uh, in my book on which I'll, I'll I'll link to later on on Kautsky and Republicanism, is that uh, in that book in the appendix I have for the first time translations of all the various competing uh, drafts of that program. Right, so there's a particular uh, period of gestation really lasting throughout the summer of 1891 in the run up to the Congress in October, where we see uh, various drafts uh, along the way that are then presented to the Congress and des decided to put within a commission and, and discussed and then presented for voting where the, the pro new program is, is accepted unanimously. Uh, you have the party leadership draft in June, Engels's critique, which we'll come back to, Worth stressing that the Engels' critique is directed against the draft of the, the put forward by the party leadership in a letter to Kautsky, right? So we have to get the genesis here of this, right? The, the, the chronology of it, right? Um, because often Engels' critique is seen as a as a critique of the final program itself, which is not exactly true. Um, you then have the leadership uh, uh, leadership's official draft from July. So you can see how these things go along. They're in contact with each other, et cetera. You have <laughs> Denoyet Zeitstraff, which is penned by Kautsky, then the Babelized so-called version of Denoyet of, of the Denoyet Zeitstraff, and then the, all of this results then in in the program itself. And in my book, I won't go into the details here, but you can see line by line every single difference within those drafts and how they come about, what they reflect about the the nature of the program itself. And I suppose the the key thing, aside from seven days of discussion, is that this is something that had been planned for a long time and had been discussed in the party press, etc., which again hasn't been dealt with in, in any detail for some years. Indeed, in 1887, in the illegal Congress held in St. Gallen in Switzerland, uh, already there we see a decision, a program commission established to say, okay, we need a new party program which reflects our new ideas, our move away from the kind of the Salian traits that Marx uh, um, uh, lampooned in the critique of the Gotha program, and uh, so th this this had been a process for, that, that lasted really for three or four years. But in the it, the, the direct run up to the Congress uh, lasted for across the eighteen ninety one. The program was viewed as not to be a kind of list of the particular issues of the day, but to sketch the transition from capitalism to socialism. I've talked about how it became a model to be emulated. It came from the Heintel program, but also uh, worth emphasizing that this was the kind of common sense across international socialism and indeed if you look at the uh program of the rsdlp the russian social democrats um you will find the exact same structure with a few differences which we'll discuss very but very minor ones actually in terms of the structure uh exactly the same and we'll talk about the structure in a second uh Kautsky's commentary on it some of you may know this it's got the the snappy title of this air for program in seinem grundsätzlichen Teil erläutert in German. And obviously the translators thought, well, when I, when I drop that, we'll just call it the class struggle. Um, but it's again worth emphasizing that the class struggle is an abridged translation of his commentary on the on the on the document itself. It's not complete. And moreover, there was another pamphlet he produced with a, a with another author called uh, um Principles and Demands of Social Democracy, which again hasn't been translated into English, but gives context to this. Another point worth mentioning here very briefly is that this book and the role of Kautsky in this uh, in this period in, in, that he played in the effort pro uh, program really sees him shoot to kind of international stardom as the kind of new kid on the block, in a sense, with Engels is getting older, but he's constantly in in, in correspondence, etc., with Engels, as we shall see over these um, things. Tina mentioned at the start the minimum-maximum program distinction, and it's worth stressing here that the um, 
Lars Lee makes this point very well in this what is to be done uh, in context. Um, minimum program is actually a slightly misleading uh, um, t- term in the sense that it implies kind of something minimal or not ambitious or not far ranging, etc., uh, in terms of its demands and its approach. And, th- and the opposite is the case. And indeed, there's a translation question here, too, because in many of the documents of the time, we the German language is, is often a lot more specific and kind of less lazy than the English language. Uh, we have in, in English have the term minimum, uh, which can mean both uh, uh, something quite small and, and ambitious on the one hand, but also the, the very least that one would do or the one would ask for. Whereas in German, that distinction is clearer with the minimal, minimum, on mindest. And often in these things, you'll see terms of das mindest program. So the, the very least, it's, it's a kind of esoteric a translation point, but it, it gets across the idea that actually what is being outlined in the practical section that we'll come on to is the very minimum basis upon which the SPD would uh, take power. Uh, and again, that's something I'm working on at the moment uh, that, that will be out in, in, in the future. And I see that the, yeah, I've got the, the, the French Workers' Party draft there. The, the language does change. It's complicated. But uh, I just wanted to highlight that because um, often in terms of historiography, as we'll see, there's a kind of there's this impression that the 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 maximum section of theoretical section and then the minimum section the political demands are somehow incongruent or in opposition or antagonism with each other uh, and that's incredibly misleading because actually the 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 guiding idea here as you will have seen with the uh, the French workers party program is is that basically the political demands in particular of of the of the program represent as i say the minimum basis upon which the SPD with majority support would take uh, power and enact that program. That is also synonymous with something that's been lost or subjected to certain distortion in Marxist historiography, which is the uh, the Democratic Republic. And I have a Marx and Engels quote here, and Engels obviously is important in this regard in terms of his critique of the, of the effort program. But essentially the idea was that once these, uh, um, the, the, the framework in which these political demands will be uh, achieved is, is what they, they call the democratic republic or the, uh, the, the, the political form at last discovered under which to work out the economic emancipation of labor. We'll come on to that in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on the, the actual program itself. You can, you can see it. It's in translation. As I said, there's a slightly updated translation in my book. Uh, which which is 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 available, um, but again the, the 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 basic structure is, and again it's taken from the Party Ouvre and the Heinfeld program, um, that you have the first section which basically outlines uh, the the course of economic development, what that means, what it entails for the workers' movement, um, what the, de- the the developmental tendencies of capitalism are why uh, the party is a, a socialist party, what that means, and how that distinguishes it from other parties. It, Kautsky, in a, in a commentary not on this program, but actually the Heinfeld program, of the, the, the revised Heinfeld program of 18, of, sorry, of 1902, uh, something I'm translating at the moment for my, uh, for my Patreon, uh, he makes the very good point that without this section, without the maximum section of the party, social democracy is unable to distinguish itself fundamentally from other parties, including bourgeois parties, right? Because they also want certain reforms, they want to achieve certain things. But Kautsky says it's the maximum program that fundamentally is what's required both for the unity of the organization, both for uh, keeping it uh, coherent and not running itself into the ground, but also that uh, that ties the, the you know the final goal in the sense that ties the the the, the party together and and as I say marks it out from the um, from the uh, the other parties. A lot has been said about the effort program. Some some nonsense that it's somehow kind of I don't know aloof to the 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 the, the idea of the working class taking power or revolution etc. And you'll read a lot of that uh, on the left more generally. Uh, but you know, I've just picked out some some uh, points here that you know, make clear that that's clearly not the case. If you look at the document, as much as it can be criticised, it can't be criticised for that. I would say. Um, and again, here just a, a list of some of the the main then immediate uh, uh, or, or, or minimum uh, demands. 
uh, as they are proceeding on the basis of these principles. I've just highlighted a few that are worth looking at. Uh, suffrage, um, proportional representation, um, abolition of um, prejudice or uh, or things that place or laws that place women at a disadvantage compared with men. That's incredibly important because with this move in the early 1890s, the SPD uh, was the first par party in 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 the German Kaiserreich to advocate uh, the full emancipation of of women, and actually uh, was was laughed at for that in 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 parliamentary debates and discussions, which is just worth kind of keeping in mind when um, when we look back on these things and what we can be proud of certainly in in our movement. Um, free expression of opinion, the secularization of schools. Uh, judges elected by the people, abolition of uh, indirect taxes and customs, with customs being a big issue in uh, in, German, in the German Kaiserreich eventually that caused huge inflation, a policy dictated by the Juncker class to keep their profits high. Um, the other thing that's, that's key in point three, and again, you'll find this in all the social democratic programs at the time, is the education of, of all to bear, bear arms and the militia in the place of the standing army. That was just kind of ABC. Of, of this movement, including actually by uh, some on the right who uh, were uneasy with aspects of the effort program, particularly its more maximal uh, section. Um, so I've talked slightly about the significance. You can see that's my book up there. That's the expensive version. There is a cheaper paperback version that you can get now, probably quite cheaply. It came out a few years ago um, with the with the drafts, etc. It's worth uh, looking at. I do hope at some point to return to this question and to also pub, uh, uh, translate quite a lot of the discussion because it's important and it, it gives a really kind of nice insight into how the what the party was thinking what the discussion points were etc um the um we should put here we should probably come on to um the uh Eng Engels in a second and uh Engels's critique um, because it's funny that the, as I said, that the, the effort program has quite a bad rap uh, due to a historical factors that we'll hopefully be able to touch upon uh, in this discussion. Uh, and even in the, this is my fault, by the way, not Tina's fault, even in the reading, you know, the, the the introductory reading, I didn't send anything through in time or whatever. And, you know, both of them are critiques. There's Lend State and Revolution, Section 4.1, I think it is. Uh, which I reread this week, and there's also Engels's critique. Now we know that now we should know, hopefully after this, what I've said, that Engels's critique is aimed at a the party leadership's first draft in a private letter to Kautsky, which is only published ten years later in 1901. Kautsky had particular motives for that, i.e., the struggle against the revisionist right, as uh, kind of using Engels as an authority figure in that sense to fight against Bernstein and others, and. Engels's critique is is really worth uh, looking at in 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 some detail, not only for its uh, for its insight into the program, but also because it's later used by two key figures in the left of our movement, I Rosa Luxemburg in 1910 and uh, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin in 1917 in State of Revolution, as, I, as I've just outlined. And what's what's forgotten, I think, in in this whole discussion. Is that if you read, and probably some of you have gone away and read the Engels thing because it was reading for today, Engels is actually rather pleased for reasons that you know make sense given what I've just said. This program, the way it's been put together, is viewed rightly as the uh, victory of uh, Marxist ideas over the Salianism, and so on and so forth. The structure clearly follows what Engels has been um, has been pursuing and, and advocating for within the within the the movement more broadly. And you know Engels is a key figure in the in the latter years of his life. He's working on Marx's manuscripts, but he's also directly intervening in a lot of the debates in the German uh, German speaking uh, parties, in particular. But Engels, uh, essentially, his his main critique is that he says it it lacks precisely what should have been said, i.e., it does not call for what I referred to earlier on explicitly for the democratic republic as the kind of culmination of all of the, the the demands so he says you know the, the demands are great but they lack the one thing they don't actually point out the goal the aim which is the culmination of those demands and that's a problem he then says okay i do understand why this might be the case why well again the context is the party has only recently emerged out of illegality so it was banned for 12 years 
you still have in the 1890s moves by some of the German conservatives to reenact the ban or to produce a new one. You have throughout this period, actually, which we often overlook, Andrew Bonnell's book gets this across really well. You have editors of newspapers in particular, social democratic newspapers, and there were hundreds of them, local newspapers, being taken to court and jailed for treason, uh, for some of the, the ideas that they're saying about the state and and and, and changing it fundamentally, etc. So the context has to be more in mind. And Engel says, well, look, maybe we can find another way of uh, of approaching this question or putting it as something like, you know, the, the concentration of power or of power in the hands of the people or something like that, right? We can find an alternative way. But it is worth stressing that that is the that's the bone of contention here. And many people then take from that a kind of original sin within the effort program. They contrast it, for example, with uh, the Russian Social Democrats who had the Democratic Republic and indeed the dictatorship of proletariat in the program. That was the, what, one difference. And they sometimes then account for the differing courses of these parties with reference to this. Now, I think that's oversimplistic, but I do nonetheless agree, and we'll come on to that in, in the context of Rosa Luxemburg in a second, that Engels's comments are indeed insightful. Uh, because he does warn even at that point that if the if we soft pedal the question of the democratic republic it does kind of give um oxygen to the development of of what he calls honest opportunism and kind of al almost implies that even though the demands don't but the absence of the clear aim kind of gives uh, room for maneuver for the old Lasallian ideas of the people, the free people state, etc, cetera, etc, cetera. the state playing some kind of uh, the existing state structure playing some kind of benevolent role in terms of cooperatives, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is really the main uh, bone of contention. And I think we'll we'll come back to that in a in a second. I've, I've still got some time. So that's good. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, Tina had in the title, the, 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 the merger formula and the merger of socialism and the workers movement. I don't want to uh, go into this in too much detail, but I will point up some flag up some issues um, because it's uh, um, the question of socialist consciousness uh, emerges here in, in, a, in a strange way. Uh, again, the article I'm working on at the moment, the translation I'm working on at the moment is one from 1902, where Kautsky is discussing the a revision of the um, of Austrian social Dem democracy's Heinfeld program. And the, and the reasons behind that and um and one of the, the the things that he says and and is picked up by lenin actually when he's writing what is to be done it's almost as if he's kind of reaching for a quote to uh kind of uh substantiate some of the claims he's making in russia and he just happens to you know grab a, the latest issue of deny it site and says oh yeah kautsky there we go and he, he quotes kautsky it's about socialist consciousness as being brought from the outside as etwas von außen hineingetragenes and um the uh the, and the whole question of, of that has, has raised a whole number of issues about uh um in, in historiography about elitist uh leninism elitist marxism etc cetera, etc cetera. um but really the uh the, the the opposite is 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 the case and it's it, you know again the, the the key study here is is Lars Lee's uh, what is to be done and basically this is just making the point that uh the the uh, the, the program of socialism uh, scientific socialism in that sense is not something that necessarily ar spon arises spontaneously within society, but is the product of uh, of the accumulated knowledge of, of of various people, many of whom happen to be uh, from outside the workers' movement directly, as we know, uh, Marx, Engels, Kautsky, etc. Uh, but we're active within it clearly. Um, so that's just worth flagging up as well. It's just this weird his the weird history of this, where the the commentary on one program ends up and has this strange long history that lives with us uh, to today. Um, taking a step back now, so we go back to Engels's critique on the the republic and the absence of the clear demand for a democratic republic. This is something, and I've written on this, and there's videos online. I'm, I'm sure I can uh, link to. This is something that is picked up in 1910 by Rosa Luxemburg in her argument with Karl Kautsky. Now, I don't have time to go into the discussions about that. Again, I've done videos on it, 1910 and all that is the YouTube talk I gave on it. And she uh, is convinced that at a time when the monarchy is becoming an increasingly important factor, the kind of personal regime of the Kaiser and how he has his kind of tentacles in all of the reactionary aspects of the Kaiser state from militarism, navalism, 
the junker class, uh, the, the police, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she makes the point that, well, look, we need to be raising the question of the republic because we have an undemocratic three-tier suffrage system in Prussia, which is the cause of these uh, mobilizations and discussions within the SPD that follow. And she says, well, look, what has happened to the question of the Republic? Where is that gone? And uh, what what happened is quite revealing in terms of the the, the development of or the, the the decline in a sense of Karl Kautsky as a theoretician, because I've got the quote here, and this is in my book. You know, he says that in 1905, clearly along the lines of Engels's critique about uh, in in terms of democracy and republicanism, he says we are republicans for the very reason that the democratic republic is the only political form which corresponds to socialism. That's exactly what Engels says. The monarchy can only exist on the basis of class differences and antagonisms. The abolition of classes also requires the abolition of the monarchy. Nineteen by 1910, however, in the context of these huge demonstrations in Prussia and beyond for uh, uh, democracy in Germany. Um, he says that it's true that our program does not explicitly mention the republic, but there's no doubt that one cannot be a good social dem democrat if one is not a good republican. We can have different opinions about the most appropriate way to express our republican point of view. But precisely because Republican propaganda encounters so many obstacles in Germany, we must all the more carefully avoid anything that might awaken in the masses the belief that we have abandoned our Republican convictions or even that we expect the monarchy to promote proletarian aims. Now, you can see and look, this is what Luxembourg points out in her critique, that there's a distinct softening here on the question of republicanism. And Luxembourg is pressing for the issue, the slogan of the republic to become kind of front and center of the party's agitation in this period and she makes the point that essentially uh the party has not made systematic uh republican propaganda for a very long time and indeed that's how she accounts for some social democrats uh going and kneeling before the 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 the, the king of uh, württemberg uh, in baden in, in baden and that's a whole number story which i've talked about but essentially she says that the malaise in the in our party with the right the right wing of reformists is essentially partly due to the fact that we have not taken republicanism and republican agitation uh, seriously in the course of that discussion which i'm also translating at the moment uh she kautsky actually says look i wrote about the republic uh elsewhere uh, i've done i've dealt with this question before it's not as if i've ignored it and and, and luxembourg says well my memory fails me i can't remember where you know what he's referring to here and what he's referring to are the texts that are in my book from from 1905 that i translated into a book so it's not that as i've just shown it's in 1905 it's not the case that kautsky somehow hasn't understood engels's critique or taken it on board or it has a different message he does but you can see over the course of time and this is something luxembourg picks up on that republicanism uh, becomes the, the, uh, so i.e the very point of the minimum program the culmination of demands is kind of soft pedaled over over time and she even the uh the, uh, quotes marx etc in his comments on the go to program on here um interesting too in relation to this 1905 series of articles that Kautsky uh, made on the minimum program and, and the ne necessity of Republican agitation is that Lenin in State and Revolution in a text that, you know, was was very quickly put together against the backdrop of very fast moving debates, uh, sorry, very, very fast moving events with very little material at its disposal. Kautsky, uh, Lenin makes the point that, uh, you know, uh, social democracy never developed a theory of the state or or, uh, or republicanism etc and there is a, certainly a truth to that but he also um kind of forgot that series uh despite having denied its site constantly at, uh, at his hand 12 years later he don't like luxembourg he'd also forgotten about that series of uh, of articles by karatsky which i argue uh for their fault they do have faults but they do nonetheless develop and build upon some of the the points that engels makes about the necessity of or the nature of the minimum program and how it how it operates and just to um, just show really how far Kautsky fell by 1927, uh, you know, he's basically saying in his in his book Historical Materialism that class aside, uh, class struggle is no longer the motor of, of social development. So you see that kind of fall from somebody who in eighty in the early 1890s was the the main thinker, the main uh, um, popularizer of the ideas of class struggle uh, and the program of social democracy uh, to somebody who moved away from that. Now, 
it's worth i think just to conclude it's worth just briefly looking at some of the um kind of uh, the, the the reception of the effort program i've talked about how uh i've, I've kind of touched upon at several occasions how it's been received etc um but i would say that even to this day and you know hopefully this will be something that's in the discussion it, it is a program that is largely maligned and misunderstood um and it's often held as responsible for the betrayal of 1914 by german social democracy uh, which I think is is simplistic, as I've as I've pointed out, uh, albeit very briefly. Um, and I would indeed argue that the the background, the motives, the debates, and the ideas behind it really are a an important um, point of reference for the left today in trying to rediscover its past following a century of defeat, but also in trying to uh, organize on the kind of level, and indeed more than the level that the SPD was able to do in terms of mass socialist common sense amongst a huge section of the working class and the population more more broadly uh, seen through a negative lens it's also worth mentioning that in terms of the uh the official communist or or many um of of us in the far left who've had our kind of history from an, an organizing on the far left there's a the tendency to junk the effort program and to put it into kind of the dustbin of history in the sense that it's either not treated at all or or done so in in, in a negative way so the, the classic text here in terms of party history and distortion of of socialist history is stalin's short course which was, i think was one of the best-selling books in in, in, the, in the, of, of socialism in the 20th century uh, and he doesn't mention the effort program at all in contrast to lenin and many of the Bolsheviks at the time who praise the effort program, who openly say we want to emulate the effort program. That's what they do in the early 1900s, as I pointed out. Uh, again, this this kind of Stalinist uh, attempt to create this gulf between, you know, revolutionary Bolshevism, and fuddy-duddy reformist uh, um, uh, German socialism, which is uh, problematic to say the least. Um, GDR historiography, which I know a fair bit about um essentially has is a bit more nuanced it actually mentions the effort program and it says look at some of the great things it did it'll cite angles of course uh, but it'll say look this it had its place in a so-called period of a peaceful capitalist development which is a common a criticism you'll also hear uh, often among uh anti-stalinist uh, uh, leftists such as such as uh, trotskyists um you also get this sense in in uh, I, and I alluded to this earlier on this you know this, this this relationship between the the ultimate aim of socialism, the minimum demands in the here and now, and the bridge to that being the culmination of those demands in the form of the democratic republic that opens up that space, opens up that transition to uh, to socialism on an international scale. Um, in in the discussions of the, uh, the, the the Western historiography, it's often said that they say these things do not fit together at all. And what's worse is because the, it ended up being the case that the the theoretical part was largely written by Kautsky with some edits, and the, the practical uh, demands were largely written by Bernstein with some edits by Babel, etc. That then many historians say, well, ah, you see, that's the classic thing because Bernstein was the revisionist reformist. Well, he wasn't in 1891, by the way. Uh, and Kautsky was this theoretical, oh, socialism will come, it's inevitable. And, you know, never the twain shall meet a century. And that was the whole history of social democracy in their idea. So they even say, look, uh, it was only in 1959, in, and this is SPD historians, it was only in, in 1959 in Bad Godesberg, uh, just outside Bonn, when the SPD finally ditched Marxism, it done it, I mean, it done it to all intents and purposes a long time ago, but it actually removed it completely from its program too, that that kind of dilemma between these two things uh, was resolved. And indeed, you know, you get the ideas of attentism and, and fatalism, which I've dealt with again in, in other places, but I'm happy to take uh, questions on, on that. Um, and yeah, I think that's uh, that's probably where I should uh, should end here. Just to say that when it comes to Luxembourg, she um, again I've written about this in an article, uh, Rosa and the Republic, where she draws uh, uh, 
looking at the, the defeat of social democracy and its betrayal in in the in, in within the German Revolution, she draws the conclusion that that past actually needs to be completely junked, which uh, many uh, others do. Uh, Lenin at the same time didn't, which doesn't make him right, of course, but I think it's worth uh, uh, mentioning that and seeing how these different positions are uh, lined up. And I do think that um, this is a part of a history that shouldn't be uh, junked, uh, but in order to gain or glean as much as we can from it, it necessitates that we actually begin to understand it on its own terms and that's some of the problem that's perhaps the main obstacle when it comes to uh, the question of the effort program and where it is and how we view it today thank you thank you very much ben excellent uh, opening could you stop sharing screen please I mean, there's a lot of uh, questions and issues that that you've touched on and that, you know, the effort program touches on. Comrades, if you have a question, I would like to make a commentary. Please click raise hand under reactions. Um, I'm going to start off asking you a, a couple of things. Um, the merger formula is interesting. Um, and last Tilly, as you say, has written a, a whole book almost exclusively around that to to oppose the idea that um, you know there's some um, the 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 Marxists believe that only they have basically, you know, there's this this idea, sorry, the, the workers' movement can go so far. They will fight for wage, higher wages, they will fight for um, you know, better working conditions, et cetera. But the idea that socialism, you know, the idea that that you have to fight for scientific socialism, not other kinds of socialism, et cetera, has to be brought from, from the outside, can can be viewed as, you know, you have you have your theoreticians, you have your leaders of the SWP, et cetera. They know it all and they just announce it in the newspaper once a week. They tell their people what it is, et cetera. And that's how it's often seen as that that is the sort of elitist kind of view. But as you said, you 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 believe that it actually it just meant it doesn't arise spontaneously. Um, you know, that you have to have some kind of bridge, you have to have some kind of understanding. The idea of socialism, are you saying cannot cannot arise spontaneously, but it doesn't have to be brought in it has to be worked out doesn't it? it it is a scientific method it has to be worked out in the sense outside your economic struggle in that sense because that will only take you so far and that goes back to this this debate can you can you speak about this a little bit more perhaps now yeah 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 so yeah i i mean it's it's it, it, it's a very complicated um uh question and it's one of these things as i said where somebody gets it's literally if you go to what is to be done um you can see that lenin is kind of he's making a few points about uh, uh the, the the economists etc and, and he's trying to score some points there and he's making the point that fundamentally what we need if the working class is truly to advance is we need a clear political program and we need a political organization now that is not something that it will necessarily arise from the economic struggle as as it was in russia at that time right so that's that's the that's the core point that he's making at the time and it's just funny to me that in order to kind of buttress that he just reaches to a shelf behind him picks up this weird commentary by Kautsky on the the revision of the Austrian social democrats program to underline that underline that point now i'm not saying that um that ne then necessarily means that it's impossible for people within the sphere of any particular economic struggle or whatever to uh, to arrive at socialist ideas but the the point would be that there is there are structures there are ideas there are traditions there that exist for us today that we would not we would be silly to neglect or to um ignore in that sense it's quite clearly the opposite of what i do right i'm trying to look at how, where things have gone wrong how ideas have changed and transformed um, how uh, things have been distorted and lost, etc. Literally lost in translation at some time. Uh, but uh, uh, but yeah. So that's that's the kind of uh, the 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 point I think because this is about party building and strategy, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that's that's a point that's worth um, uh, hammering home. So with it, with this idea that you know um, that the idea of socialism. You know, a lot of people think it's you know socialism, and yeah, Jeremy Corbyn seems to think that is 
being nice to each other. You know, if we all just sort of love each other more, etc., that's the way to socialism. It's not, though, is it? No, I think so. Again, it, it, it's hard to draw uh, obvious parallels with these things, but that that just strikes me as kind of you know more of the utopian uh, st- stuff that, that the Marx and Engels are criticizing. Uh, it obviously has a certain place. It's a product of certain historical constellations in the 20th century. The the experience of socialism as being you know not particularly nice and lovey dovey and all the rest of it. Um, but yes, the, the question would be, and it, and it's a more complicated one from our perspective today, in a sense, is that you know where are we, right? That that's what that's what you start with. You don't start with oh, there's a big strike in in X part of Russia or of Germany, right? Or there's a big or there's a war here or something. What you start with is where are we in terms of human history, as as much as we can understand that. What what is the nature of the system we live under, i.e. capitalism? How is that developing? How do we foresee it developing? And what does that mean for uh, the organization of those that we think, on the basis of some understanding both of the uh, of the society itself and the uh, and, and 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 the working class as the agent of revolutionary change? How do we start going about that? Right. And I think that's the uh, that's the the the, the kind of main point here that's being being made but it had a it had a whole history as i say with uh, people picking up on it as a kind of this reflective of elitist uh um marxism you know not trusting the workers uh etc cetera, etc cetera, and you know, having to lead them by the nose and uh, uh and spoon feed them and all the rest of it. that's that's not what it's about it's it's, it's about providing the for you know it, 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 if anything it's the opposite it's a confidence in the ability of workers with the correct uh, um ideas and structures to you know, assimilate this stuff and and take it on and, and take it all within all sorts of places. That's the point. And learning from our history, taking yeah. collective knowledge as well, isn't it? Learning as a exactly. as a class and not just as as individuals. Um, just on the question, then, I mean, we're making a big thing here about minimum maximum program, and you know, this is obviously what Marx and Engels were arguing for. And yet today, you see a lot of Marxists, socialists arguing against the minimum maximum program instead for a transitional program not always on a theoretical level it's just that's that what what clearly is needed because Trotsky said so where do you see the main differences between a transitional and minimum maximum approach and you know not just historically but also today if if there's a difference well I think the um the, the 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 point is kind of half made in in my last response is that where do you start what is what is your point of departure now the transitional program has its own particular history what i can say here in terms of the move away from that is something i referred to and again i've written an article on this uh in uh fr- from the debates in in the russian social democrats and the bolsheviks in 1919 and again i can i can recommend that in the chat later on where i look at this in detail and i, I you know i mentioned how luxembourg for example because luxembourg thinks that essentially the epoch of uh the minimum maximum program is over we need something new we need to get rid of the minimum program she says so the immediate task now in germany and indeed elsewhere is to is socialism that's the immediate question on the agenda which i think was wrong at the time and i think it's still wrong now right you still you have to have the framework within which the working class can come to power and that wasn't on the cards in 1918 uh, 19 you still needed the kind of constitutional basis that the it, you know the, the the effort program kind of outlined right so there is this there, there is a a, a a tendency then uh, in 1918 to draw particular historical conclusions from the experience, the failure of social democracy. Bukharin and his supporters in the journal Communists make very similar points actually at the same time. And again, if you look at the debates there, Lenin is saying, well, look, we've got state power in Russia, but we still need the minimum program because we actually might lose state power, right? And we still need that that framework. So these are discussions that go on. The whole transitional uh, um uh, program and debates etc that's a, that's a much bigger topic but in terms of method i would argue that fundamentally uh what trotsky was trying to do in terms of his his time and his efforts were trying to say well look th- th- we've got some kind of structures here there is an organized working class uh there are mass trade unions there are mass parties in most places the issue is leadership as opposed to consciousness so with the right leadership based around the existing questions that are unfolding 
that leadership can be changed and will take in the thing. Now, that I think you know there, there are merits to that I think it was wrong at the time, but clearly now in the context that we're working, it's about rebuilding some, something uh, you know qualitatively different. And I think there are lessons to be taken from the, you know, the a time where in the 1880s, uh, 1890s, the working class is consolidating itself into viable mass organizations, right? Um, and that that obviously comes with a lot of baggage. There are negative examples. There are there are problems, etc. But I think it's a it's a better point of of departure in that sense, right? A couple of sentences. What then is the maximum program? So the maximum program is essentially if you if you read these programs, it's it's a couple of paragraphs basically on saying we are for. Uh, uh, the socialization of the means of production we are for the liberation of humanity without distinction of sex race uh, what nationality i think it says uh you know that we are for we are for uh communism right we are for a communist society and, and what um Kautsky makes the point that if you don't have that and this is what bernstein was constantly trying to get at right he's saying well look it's all these kind of mad ideas that are, of the future etc they're getting in the way of doing our are compromises with certain parties to achieve certain reforms, right? And Kautsky makes the point, a very strong point. And again, I'll, I'll have this article translated soon, this, this weird article that Lenin picks up in 1902. It's a very good article because he says that, you know, that without the maximum program, we are just another, we're a left-wing party of social reform. So again, these these debates echo through to today because there are many people who, you know, in, often in good conscience will say, look, Let's forget all the high ideas of, you know, uh, um, liberating humanity and all this kind of stuff. Let's just focus on getting the work done, the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. And that's what will you know, that, that will is what will achieve positive results as opposed to just being in an opposition and, and et cetera, et cetera. And Luxembourg makes it very as critical as I am of her in terms of the conclusion she draws in 1919. She makes the excellent point in the 1910 discussions that she says it's not only the maximum program that has kind of been relegated to what she calls Sunday speeches and things. It's also key tenets of the minimum program. So things like, uh, you know, the Republic, things like dissolving the army, uh, you know, dissolving the standing army for the people's militia. These are things that are seen as a bit too kind of uh, um, left field and, and crazy. They're also rele relegated. And what she says quite quite rightly is that once you start to take away these key features of the program you essentially become knowingly or not the kind of party that the the spd became in in 1918 19 where it still was a radical left-wing party but it presided over a bourgeois state right and a bourgeois army and a bourgeois uh, uh, police force etc etc so i think that's the um those are the kind of things i would i would say that that echo through to today and so the, the maximum, maximum program is the sort of compass isn't it that keeps you yeah this is where we want to go this is the direction we might do this and this in the meantime and we might swing left or right but this is where we're going which if you don't have it yes you, you yeah. can get lost um one uh, last thing i was going to pick you up on um or well, actually the the angles when his in his article is critiques quite quite interesting as you say it's a draft etc but the, you mentioned that in, in passing is this idea of um, the old society may develop peacefully into the new one. And this is something that um, I've had loads of discussions and I'm sure you have too with some, some of our Trotskyist friends in particular who think this is absolute nonsense that you could ever, you know, the revolution must be. And, you know, there can't be any democracy. It has to be, it has to be violent. It has to be lawless i've heard a few times it has to be without any rules etc the revolution will be you know mayhem etc and that's what needed to to take over and here you have engels you know close closest collaborator of marx um this is a funny funny paragraph of course i'll, I'll paraphrase it just really you know he's, he says in germany you can't have that you couldn't have a peaceful peaceful road um because you have monarchy etc but he says them um, uh, one conceived that the old society may develop peacefully into the new one in countries where the representatives of the people concentrate all power in their hands, where if one has the support of the majority of the people, can one can do as one sees fit in a constitutional way in democratic public republics like France and the USA. Uh, in monarchies such as Britain, where the immediate abdication of the dynasty in return for financial compensation is discussed in the press daily and where this dynasty is powerless against the people. 
Now this is obviously things change, etc. But it is an interesting, an interesting idea that that also the Chartists, of course, developed when they they had their slogan was you know peacefully if we can, forcefully if we must. But this 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 is denied by by many Marxists, isn't it? That that anything like that could ever be possible. How would it be possible in view of you if it would be possible? I think Engels is wrong though. I, I think so. I, so the 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 point is is that. What's good about this stuff is that you see that there's no, that Engels is, is thinking creatively, right? There's not just a kind of this ready-made schema. There are differences between absolutist Germany and Britain and Republican France, etc. But then if you read other, his writings, for example, on 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 the French Third Republic, you know, he basically says that, you know, this is this is the empire without the emperor, right? So even in, in republics, there needs to be a fundamental overhaul of the constitution and changing it and, and you know and, and creating something new uh, you could even say especially in republics right because there is this view and this is the whole basis of my Kautsky book is Kautsky's arguments with French socialists that say basically we we've essentially got socialism we just need to kind of now form the government and we're done do you know what I mean and uh and, and I think Kautsky's very strong on that and saying no that's that's the, what he calls republican superstition uh and including American socialists so I think um this creative thinking um and 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 not you know he talks about the federal republic which I, I, again I think is also important in the British context um and so on but I think the um yeah the the, the some of the the ideas of uh um uh, of, of the, the you know, constitutional coming to power are problematic, which does not mean to say, however, that you know a a relatively peaceful uh, transition to, uh, or revolution is not is off the cards. So that, I think that that that's a different conclusion altogether, right? But what it is, I think, w- what needs to be stressed more is that it, it needs a fundamental break with the existing uh, uh, state apparatus, and that you know that that requires force. I mean, Engels says against the anarchists, doesn't he? Can you imagine? Uh, um, uh, an act that's more authoritarian than a, than a revolution, right? You can't. It's a one one section of society imposing its will on another. But how that the concrete form that takes and how that re- pertains to and reflects existing political institutions is a different question. And the whole Engels peaceful thing was also a, a big bone of contention in the SPD subsequently, and uh, and even by the Euro communists in in Britain actually in the eighties. So you see how these things filter through. Mm. But um, I mean, if you're talking relatively peaceful, you can, uh, you know, if the working class builds up its own forces, I mean, the more prepared we are, if we have our own army, et cetera, our own militia, et cetera, you know, if if we have, if we are better prepared than them, et cetera, you know, who knows mm. how, how violent it has to get, uh, et cetera. But yes, this we take this effort um, critique within, with a pinch of salt. Sure, and it's time. We've got a few. We've got a few people with their hands up now. Um, just indicate when you want to come in if you need a rest or whatever. But um, it it works normally best if we have one question, one one answer. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Steve Freeman first. It's right up your street, isn't it, Steve? It's right <laughs> up my garden path or something like that. Tina couldn't couldn't, couldn't have. Wish for anything better. Well done, Ben. You've nailed it on the head, I think, with that. So what else can I say apart from can repeat? I will make a couple of points. So just for emphasis, not because you haven't really covered them, but I just think they need to be sort of taken a bit. I mean, I've been arguing up to this point that we should t- you, we should use the term Republican communist rather than narco communist. By Republican communist, I mean that's a a recognition that the democratic republic is central to a republican communist. Whereas if you're an anarcho-communist or even a kind of ultra-left, then you tend to think, oh, let's blow up the state, let's just abolish the state immediately. Whereas we as republican communists think we are going through a process of winning state power through a republic. And the term republican communist then makes it clear that the minimum program is really the republican program in the way that you've just illustrated for us. And the maximum program is the communist program. So that term republican communist, I think, captures that very, very neatly. And the problem if you just use the term, and of course, these two parts, republicanism and communism, they form a whole. But I think you could argue that the republican bit is actually transitional. I mean, you can call it minimum. But in a way, it's also transitional because the idea of it is you can fight for real reforms, that you can mobilize the masses of people to win those reforms. Because in actual fact, in the program that you showed us, most of those things are in people's consciousness anyway. They're not completely outlandish. 
you know, they might, they're, they're all things that people in our society say, oh, that's, you know, that's, that's reasonable. They're things that people can win and can be won, but it takes you to somewhere else. It takes you to a position where the working class can take power. And in that sense, the minimum is also transition with a small t. I mean, I don't mean in the Trotsky's way transitional. So I think if you, if you call it the Republican program, then I think you get away from this, does minimal mean minimal? Does it mean minimum, et cetera? You know, and, and, and it's important to emphasize that a Republican program is not simply a single issue thing. It's not about like abolishing the king. You don't need to have a king to have a Republican program, as you've already emphasized. The full program is just as applicable if you're in a presidential republic as you said, in the case of America or France today. So you can still have a Republican program, even in, in a republic. And the thing about the Corbyn program, because that's where we need the, the critique of the Corbyn program. The Corbyn program, you could think, was a minimal program. You could think that it was a set of concrete reforms that could be won in the 217-219 Labour manifestos which the left is still in England, is still enthused about that. But it's really a reform within, under the, within the confines of a constitutional monarchy. And so I think what you said about Rosa Luxemburg is very relevant, actually, because she said they'd done, I think you said bugger all, did you say? They'd, they'd done bugger all about it. And I think you could say, well, the English left, they've done bugger all about republicanism and therefore they will always inevitably be useless in in terms of actually taking it forward and i think you can say and i'll finish on this because you, you we're using that phrase about how consciousness comes to the working class you know that we were discussing before and you could apply that to the republican program as well and you say does does the working class naturally automatically spontaneously by going on strike become recognize the need for a Republican program? And I think it's a two, two part answer. I think that working class people understand Republicanism a lot better than most people imagine. They don't really need us to tell, tell them anything much about that. You can, you, can, you can sort of see that in the whole way in which workers struggle for sovereignty and democracy and all these things, it's kind of natural. And yet at the same time, the other point is also true. You have to have a scientific understanding of republicanism about the party, the tactics, which doesn't come spontaneously from people going on strike. You know, and if you want to know good tactics, republican tactics, you've got to read something like Lenin's Two Tactics, which is a very sophisticated argument. Two Tactics of Social Democracy in the Democratic Republic or the Democratic Revolution, I think it's the proper title to it. And that is about Republican tactics. And there's no way those tactics arrive naturally and spontaneously in the workplace. They come from the scientific study of the history of the working class. So I'll, I'll finish there. Yep. Well put. Thank you, Steve. Um, ben, before I bring you in, shall I um, ask the question by Bill, which is in the Q and A? Yeah, I, I just I just wrote to him. I, I've read it. So, yes. Yeah, do you want to read it? It's quite long, but I, I, it's about the role of Wilhelm Niebnecht. Yeah, if you could sum it up, perhaps. That, yeah. Be so um so bill makes two good points so one one is a correction i said that the the letter to uh, from engels was to kautsky was addressed to kautsky and then dug up in 1901 as a kind of hammer to hit the uh, revisionist which is not entirely true because he uh, as bill's pointed out this is um it was actually addressed to Liebknecht, Wilhelm Liebknecht, what the, the, the one of the two main leaders really in the German socialist movement who died, and then the the, the letter itself was found, so they published it, um, and, and and I think that's the, so that's a, that's an important uh, uh, correction. Thank you for that. Um, so the uh, he goes into a little bit, and this is something I haven't looked at for a while in terms of the draft. So Liebknecht was involved uh, in in this process as well, um, and he says. Um, is there a reason why um, that, that Liebknecht was kind of unhappy with the way things panned out, right? Was it just a personal thing? Um, so he says, uh, he says the SPD's party executives draft, i.e. the first one that was then developed and worked upon by several people, um, was largely written by Liebknecht, which I think is right. Um, and then it, it was kind of junked in favour of Die Neue Zeit's one with Babel's input. So Babel would have been on the party executive as well, but in the end chose to kind of Babelize Kautsky's uh, uh, draft and and go from there. 
and um, he talks about a, 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 a you know it, what what are the possible reasons for that, uh, and he points out that the 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 usual stuff you find in in historiography is not very helpful i.e kind of uh, the determinist kautsky versus the voluntarist Liebknecht. um all i would say on that is i don't think it's personal per se but i do remember reading a while back in a book on engels uh, and the effort program which i need to i'll i'll i need to find the reference written I'll, I'll send it to you um that basically uh the uh that Liebknecht himself was actually closer to a lot of the Lasallian ideas on this question. Whether you can put that as a question of uh, um, voluntarism and determinism, that seems slightly simplistic to me and re reflective of the, the, the usual literature on this stuff. Um, but it seems to me that there were political differences. But as you know, as you probably know, I think you, you mentioned it, yeah, the, um, it, in the end, he was kind of rolled out as somebody, he was the person that essentially opened the the, the air for uh, Congress, if I remember correctly, defending the new program. So he was kind of sent out to be a kind of authority behind it, even though um, th there there were some objections there and, and history in terms of he wasn't a uh, absolutely happy with it. But I need to dig up that that reference again, and, and th thank you for pointing that out because it's a, it's it's a good point again. The, the the genesis behind this whole thing, like I said, I put together the drafts, but trying to see exactly who was saying what and why um, is important, and as I said, reflects the that um uh underlines the point that i made in terms of we have this protocol this this record of seven days of discussions at airfoot about not only the program but about the party statutes about legality and structures uh that really it hasn't been touched and, and i say i i haven't looked at it you know in any detail for a while but i think it needs to be um yeah more widespread so thank you bill also interesting isn't it seven days of just yeah. discussion and months before that discussions and and debates etc and changes i mean today usually you get it you know here's the founding conference here it is you're not allowed to make any great amendments etc um so did they have these discussions open in the party press or was it so normal yeah. members as well could get involved and follow all of that I, I'm not sure about normal members in the sense of, you know, there would be a particular structure for submitting articles. And as far as I know that in, in terms of submissions, there would it would largely depend on it, it would mainly be journalists, party journalists and stuff that are writing in the paper. Uh, but also you have to you, you have to realize as well that the you have these four main drafts that are, are prepared in a commission, but there are then also the 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 antrig of the um, the motions. To the F, so, so there are party, local party uh, regions then feeding off it, and you know, and generally, I would say I, I'm actually working on something else at the moment from 1905. So I'm looking at the Yena Congress where they completely, yes, yeah, so Bill's right. There's a program commission of 25 pitch people, and I think, as far as I remember, uh, if I remember rightly, that program commission was was agreed or um, the commission was set in 1887. Actually, so you can, so it's not as this 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 kind of um, you know, this bottom up process, it was. And, and again, you have to remember that in, in the anti-socialist laws, the party fact that the the the, uh, the the party deputies in the Reichstag, they had quite a lot of power because they were legal. Right. They could actually speak and organize, etc., whereas the party members couldn't. So it was a top down process in that sense. And I think, yeah, 25 people agreed upon, uh, uh, decided three or four years earlier. Right. Um, but yes, in the run up to the to the to the Congress, there were um, uh, uh, articles in the paper it's in, in the various papers but also the motions which again i have i have to go away and, and look at it's kind of tiny old gothic german writing hundreds and hundreds of pages of somebody just very faithfully keeping a stenographic record of all of the uh things which is a you know an amazing resource and the idea the, the fact that these things have been neglected for so long is is criminal really you know it's amazing how much time they took took over yeah. that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, international conferences as well. They lasted for weeks sometimes, yeah. and fresh thrashing things out when at a time when traveling was uh, hugely more difficult than it is today. Um, Peter had his hand up earlier and then it, it vanished again, but he's back now, so I'm going to take him next. Hi, Peter. Oh, can't hear you. You are, it says you're unmuted, but I don't think you are. Or maybe you need to turn the volume up or something. Try now. No, can't hear you at all, unfortunately. Is that now? Yes, now we can hear you. Hi. Great, thank you. 
Yeah, uh, sorry about that before. Hi, Ben. Thanks, thanks for your talk. Um, you know, it's uh, nice to uh, you know to listen to someone that um, uh, you know just heavily involved in the research around this and doing the translations around the different programs. Uh, you know, uh, specifically around that important time as well of the um, 1890s to, through to um, Lenin's period and uh, the Bolsheviks. Um, I've just got a quick question, and you know, uh, it's clearly it's clear that you you, know, you see a lot of um, good, you know, that was done with the Fed program. It's it's minimum and maximum program, as you explained it. Um, and I was just wondering, like, you know, the other way we say all history is kind of present history if it's if it's to be useful anyway, and uh, something to learn by. <clears throat> Um, and you have sort of uh, intimated in the talk that you do feel that there's elements of the AFA program in that, in that particular organisation um, that could be uh, applicable today. And uh, I was just wanting to ask you how, how, how it might be applicable, what parts of it, the minimum, maximum, both or one or the other. Um, so just that's one question. The, the, the next question is like, mentioned um, a couple of times, um, which is obviously crucial, the Democratic Republic, and um, it was mentioned by another speaker before. And in, you know, you mentioned Marx and Engels, and in particular, I think it was reference to, to Marx, when basically he was saying that um, we've now discovered, um, you know, the secret of the, you know, the organizational form of the uh, Democratic Republic. And I'm wondering whether that's linked to the kind of aims of the AFA program as expressed through the fledgling SPD, or it differed entirely, because um, I don't think that come out. And uh, I suppose that's um, not my two questions. Cheers. Thanks, Peter. Do you want to answer that straight away, Ben, or should I take somebody else? Yeah, I, I can do. I think just for if, if that's okay with everyone. I mean, I'd, I'd be quite uh, quite brief. Um, yeah. So, so what's what's good or what's what's potentially usable or workable? I, I think it's 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 the structure of the program in particular. It's also the idea that we need a program. That it's not something that you just kind of uh, come up with one day. It needs to be informed by you know a, a whole body of, of of theory and understanding of the world. That it's the the nature of the program itself is that you know it's not a list of particular interpretations or uh, um, ideas that one has to have. One has to you know accept the program for what it is and work towards its aims, etc. I think that's that's all all good stuff. And maybe I didn't explain the the Democratic Republic question uh, as well as I should have. But essentially, the point would be that, again, if you look at Marx's writing on the Gotha program, he says, well, look, this idea of the free people state is 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 a nonsense. What what we actually need is a, is a different uh, state form. And he even and this is Luxembourg. This is not me reading Marx. This is me reading Rosa Luxembourg recently. And she says that, you know, Marx was so insistent upon the, the, the point that Engels raises about the, the, the culmination of the minimum program being the Democratic Republic, that he even said in terms of the Gotha program, it's not even worth having political demands if you aren't going to have what the, the culmination of those demands represents, right? You might as well just get rid of them and waste the time. Um, so I think the, the, the structuring, the, uh, you know, the, the, the basic outline is important. Clearly, there's been a lot of history since then. A lot has changed. And I think generally the approach, I didn't talk about this, but generally the approach in the 19th century workers movement was basically to take um some so you'd have the the clear political sections so you'd have the political demands right that, that that would outline i talked about some of those then you'd have things like worker protection insurance you know taxation things like that kind of lobbed on and they were essentially just taken from the workers movement at the time we're in, we're in a different workers movement at the time now i think you need um I, I think the ec economic the, the the economic approach of the effort program would need to be rethought as well in terms of the demands that are raised simply because of the history of the 20th century and social democracy and the way that economic reforms you know many of those economic reforms have been achieved but they've been achieved at the at the expense if you like of integrating the working class into the existing state form does that make sense so it's not as if you can just go hey the effort program and its demands are sticking here some are quite relevant but it's the it's it's the fundamentally it's the approach it's the structure it's the 
ideas underlying the, the the whole program in the first place and the necessity of a of a party with a clear program uh that i think is 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 uh, uh, informative enduring or whatever today does that make sense it's the it's the more the structure than the actual individual demands per se and she asked about the democratic republic i thought i dealt with that so so yeah so basically it's so the the, the democratic republic is essentially the, the for, again uh it, it it varies across time but if you read marx and engels again i can recommend my book on this um essentially you know it, it, in Marx and Engels, it's it's synonymous with the rule of the working class or the or the the constitutional framework within the working within which the working class rules. So, again, what I talk about in the in the Kautsky book is Engels makes the point that you know a truly democratic republican state was something along the lines of the Paris Commune. Why? Because you had the dissolved standing army, the armed people, etc., regular elections, recallability, etc. Uh, Engels uh, missed out the workers' wage thing in his uh, the workers' wage for all. Officials, as did, as did Luxembourg, by the way, uh, but that's the, the the framework which is outlined. If you look closely at the political demands of so the first part of Section Two in the Effort Program, and indeed the Heinfeld Program, and indeed the RSDLP, those political demands they provide the the basis on which uh, the working class will 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 come to power. Democratic or uh, re Republican democracy, right now. Uh, we've had uh, other experiences of, of, of that since we had the, so the, so the Soviets, etc. But fundamentally, my point would be is that the form is is uh, subordinate to the content. It's the democratic republican content that's outlined in these uh, in these programs that must be uh, fundamental and and guiding. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the democratic republic. It's the the the, the constitutional framework within which the working class will uh, will take power. And um, it's find it finds immediate reflection in the political demands of the programs of social democracy. It's not just the absence of a monarch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, so again, Engels's point is that you know um, there's there's nothing more republic, there's nothing more monarchical than the French Third Republic, basically, because you just have a president that's hardly even elected anyway, uh, that has all the power that the monarch once had, right? Uh, and that's true also in in a sense of the of Weimar Germany. It was a more democratic constitution in a sense, but you know, as it things went on, the power of the president, presidential executive uh, executive orders and things like that. Um, that would be the point. Certainly, like America, France today, republics that you know are um, you know presidential or you know semi-monarchical in the way that they they can and do operate. Yep. Ian, uh, just a brief question. Uh, good evening, comrades, and thank you very much, Ben, because that was an excellent presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask about because uh, you, you mentioned the final adoption of the effort program. If I if I didn't see you, was was unanimous, but was there not? An organised opposition at all, because quite yeah. clearly, um, I mean, and if there was an opposition, were they crusty old Vassalians, or or was there the, already the beginnings of a of a developing revisionist movement within the SPD that that, that was organising um, in opposition, maybe to the effort program, or or you know, just curious about the the, the 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 fractions that were taking place within the SPD. Yeah, very good question. That's something I didn't, uh, I, I, I planned to include, but didn't get round to. And that's the the opposition. It, it's kind of a, a strange uh, English translation because it's reminiscent of the 1980s comedy with Rick Mail, but they were called the Young Ones, uh, the Jungen. And uh, this is a group in Berlin, essentially, mainly in Berlin, of intellectuals and uh, trade unionists was, uh, that was essentially, their, their main point was that um, they they felt that the airfoot program and its approach gave too much scope to what they called parliamentarism. Now, looking back, they, 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 I, let me let me make clear from the outset that the opposition was a was a, a, a kind of semi anarcho one. They 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 were either left the party or were expelled, or some of them that actually became revisionists later on. Right? Uh, there's there's a good book that called Marxism. German Marxism and the Intellectuals by Stanley Pearson. I mean, it's not a good book in terms of its uh, intellectual framework because it's Cold War, but it does outline how the relationship between people like Paul Kampfmeier in Berlin and what's the guy uh, that produced the uh, Max Schipper and uh, you know, so, so people like that that were kind of influenced by the left, in, 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 by this de Jungen, the young ones left. In, in Germany at the time where they ended up but there is but, but I think what where they had a point was that you know you they, they were they were wary 
of the dominance of the Reichstag parliamentary group and its power. And again, that's something I'm working on at the moment in terms of 1905. Um, when when the party gives itself not a new program but a new organizational statute um I'm, I'm doing this project kind of in the search of democratic centralism right and um and it it does strike me that because the party the, the reichstag parliamentary faction had so much power in the anti-socialist laws that does carry over into how the party is shaped in its early years right but essentially the opposition of de Jong came down to well we don't want to stand for parliament we don't want to do that what's far more important is direct action trade union work etc etc and it just fizzed and went nowhere so it wasn't a it was only an anticipation of revisionism insofar as that impatience if you like or the 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 the, the uh, the disgruntlement with the kind of the, the the longer term strategy that's outlined in the effort program later f- saw some of them flip from being on the far left of the party to rejoin in it and being supporters of Bernstein, right? To say, we need to get something done. We need to do positive work. We can't just be oppositionist, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, that was the, that was the, the those were the young and the, the young, we could call them the young uns, I suppose. And, uh, and they were, they were largely either expelled or they left after a heated, uh, uh debate and, 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 you know, quite a fractious run up as well. So that was, that was going on parallel to these discussions, but in terms of the, uh, the party, I, I, it, it, they had no, as far as I can see, they had no, um, influence on the nature of the, of the party program or its organizational statutes, because basically was a kind of take it or leave it thing but yeah revisionism at that point really is is kind of in its infancy you do have though um Georg von Falmar's El Dorado speeches uh, El Dorado named after the Munich pub that he gave he gave a series of speeches which again I've translated some of those on my website uh where he basically starts to get this idea that now that we're not now that we're no longer illegal we don't have to be so fiercely anti-constitutional, if that makes sense. We can we can find a place within this Kaiserreich to create the best possible conditions and reforms for the working class. So the the Jungen is kind of a little bit of a, a reaction to that as well, because Vollmer was very influential in the party. Um, but that's really the in 1891 at least. That's really the only. Uh, signs of a kind of rightward trend and Bernstein and people like that are not involved with that uh, at that time. Thank you. Um, okay, there's still a few people with their hands up. Uh, Gil, I think, was next. Hi, Gil. Oh, we can't hear you. Um, I might have muted you. Got it. Okay. Sorry. But, uh, yep. You Hi, want Ben. Good to, to see you. Good to see you, Gil. <laughs> I have four points. Uh, one, how tight is the connection between the minimum and maximum program? If there's one party, the connection's tight. Um, if you gain power, you can implement your maximum program. Uh, but what happens if there are multiple parties? Uh, in Russia, there actually were um, at the beginning. Um, how things happen in other countries, of course, there's never been a, a successful revolution as, as, as envisioned. Uh, but Marx says the Democratic Republic is where the class struggle will be carried out. And if there are multiple parties, um, the Marxist party, the Socialist Party, is going to have to fight to get its maximum program implemented. And so so that's the question, how long does this transition period go? So just a conceptual point, and particularly in the United States, um, you know, it's so big and there are so many different interests, I have a hard time seeing that the Workers' Party is gonna be, take power and and be the majority, and there won't be a problem of, of, of political fights. Okay, that's one point. Uh, the other thing, of, I get, this is an old one, Lars Lee and Lenin rediscovered, um, and, the, and the content of the merger formula. Lee does not mention the Democratic Republic uh, in Lenin rediscovered. And so that, that raises the question of the political content of the merger formula. And we know 
Lenin's interpretation of the merger formula is you had to merge the working class fight for the democratic republic. Um, and it wasn't just in Russia. He said the same thing about France in regard to the Dreyfus case. So that's the content of the merger formula, um, which is an issue in the history of Marxism. Uh, the third point is what is to be done? Um, there are two meanings of inside and outside uh, in what is to be done. There's a difference between chapter two and chapter three. Um, chapter two, when, when Lenin grabs Kautsky's quote, it's, it's about science and, and bourgeois intellectuals developing the science uh, and not workers. Uh, but in chapter three, um, it's, it's politics. Where does politics comes from? come from. And politics comes from outside the economic struggle. It's the total struggle of the society. Um, and it's, it's, it's irrelevant who develops it. Um, workers, intellectuals, whatever. It's political people uh, insisting on democracy rather than economism. Um, and so that, you know, then that, so that, that, that's just another question of what, uh, what is political consciousness? Um, is it, is it, just the science and the generality of the development of society, or is it actually the political struggle and the content of it? And the fourth point then is uh, Plekhanov and, and, the, and the Emancipation of Labor Group uh, program of 1887. Um, again, I mean, uh, Lenin was familiar with Plekhanov and all of that literature before the Air Force program was ever written. And so you're right, that the question of a program um, was widely discussed. Um, all the strategy tactics theory. Um, and again, the, the Russian program was different. Uh, there was no compromise about the democratic republic and, and universal and equal suffrage and overthrowing the czar, um, which I, again, I find much more consistent with Marx and Engels clear statement of what the Democratic Republic is compared to the fudging that the, the Germans, you know, and, and I don't think you can characterize the weaknesses in, in the German expression as original sin. I mean, Engels gets it right. There's a weakness. And if it's not corrected, it will lead to bad consequences. And, and it did. Um, you know, so, okay, those are my four points. Great seeing you. Good questions. Ben. So, yeah, so just to come back, to, cheers, Gil. Yeah, good, good points. I, I largely agree with you. I think the only um, thing I'd pick you up on is the connection between minimum and maximum program. Maybe we differ, maybe it's just a slip of tongue. I think if you gain power, then clearly you're carrying out your minimum program. Right, you're not carrying out the maximum program. Of course, the two are related, but the 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 ideas you you know the political structures you put in they open up that transition hopefully, right? But when the Bolsheviks come to power with the left SRs, they are clearly trying to implement their minimum program and struggling, right? Because there's all sorts of obstacles along the way. So yeah, the minute so you know it's it's not a straightforward thing, and there's obviously a dynamic tension between the two things, right? Because it, there's a temporal distinction, but there's also a political one, and you know. So all I would say is that. Yes, in terms of the, you know, the, the question of coalitions, etc., the, the the point would then be: Are you able to a judge that you have a uh, majority support in the sense that what you can do is achievable, right? And which I think was the case in in Russia, nineteen seventeen, particularly with left SR coalition support, right? So you've got that peasantry uh, connection as well. Uh, and and is are you able to achieve enough of your minimum program uh, to open up that transition that you want to see, um, you know, and, and 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 implement that? And I think that's the that that's the the, the question. That, though, these are the difficult questions that that, that 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 will be made. And you know, the the idea that the, the SPD type idea was okay. We will create. You know, we will fight for reforms. As Luxembourg says, we will fight for universal equal suffrage for, for everyone with proportional representation. We will fight for the democratic republic, right? Uh, 
and we would on that on, on that, that level you know if, if the bourgeoisie is willing to arm the people right well that's a good reform we'll take it do you know what i mean right that's the you know if, if we're gonna have armed but you know the thing about the bourgeois state it doesn't really do that so what i'm saying is that there, there is a there's not it's not a schematic thing of like oh now we get to x point we can now take power and do this. It could be that there are things along the way and all the rest of you know, it. So we're not being dogmatic about it, but I think the the framework is the democratic Republic. And are you able to carry out your minimum program? Right. And I think we agree on that. I think it was just a, maybe a slip of the tongue, you know, because th that obviously opens up the, the transition. Um, yeah. And the question of other parties is, you know, again, we, one shouldn't be uh, dogmatic about it. Right. You would expect that, um, in, in the society we live in now, uh, where the working class is over, the overwhelming majority in most in most countries now across the world, that would create a different situation than say in Russia in 1917. But one still has to be, uh, uh, you know, to, to make concrete political judgments on the basis of is this a strategic advance for the working class or not, right? Um, and uh, you know, and, and I think we we agree on that. These are things you can't have ready-made answers to and if you do then you know you're not really thinking in politics you're just thinking in dogma um liam liam lend discovered on the democratic probably yeah i mean i agree i think the I, I think the the republican aspect of marxism is something that is really being treated very poorly and i would say that there's you, you know i the, the reason i got into this stuff was when um was it one of the royal family people here the older one william he got married i was like i need to look up marxism and republicanism you know what is there and you know i came across this kautsky series which really is kind of it's not standalone but in terms of the german spd there's very few uh, longer treaties on on republicanism right and i think that um that's something that lars uh, misses in terms of the 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 the, the, the question of political consciousness etc i absolutely agree with you by the way on the question of uh, intellectuals, bourgeois intellectuals, inside, outside. It depends what you mean, doesn't it, right? But it would just be fairly silly. You know, th th there are always exceptions, like Dietzkin was a worker, right? He was a very good uh, popularizer of Marxism, a, a Marxist thinker in his own right. He, you know, his day job was a worker. He wasn't like a Marx who would just flounce around all day and, you know, read and write and work till six o'clock in the morning, reading some books, bookworm and etc. cetera. Um, but the point is, is what is, you know, these ideas can come from all sorts of places, but the, the, all, all I would say is if we want to arrive at a rounded political consciousness, right, which I think is, I take your point, it's not for, for us, I think changing the world is fundamentally about political consciousness in the first instance, right? But again, if you think about the SPD and what was some of the greater aspects of it, and I'm working at the moment, as you know, because on the Patreon, I'm working on Marxism and education. I'm working on Marxism and the family, right? So, so it, it's that political consciousness, but it is drawing on the best aspects of what you want to call bourgeois science or bourgeois intellectuals or bourgeois politicians bourgeois republicans and trying to create our own voice and our own outlook on the world right so the inside outside thing i think is just very unhelpful but and i think lars is really good on this it fed into a very silly debate then about the bend in the stick and all that in terms of lenin you know this elitist versus and it just it's just nonsense do you know what i mean it's as i say it's literally lenin picking up an article that should be with you in a few days gil so you'll enjoy that that's the kautsky one <laughs> it's a very good article actually um and the yeah the emancipation labor group i i, I forgot to mention that that program and it's important because again the, the the i think the benchmark here or the 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 point of reference is the party ouvrier program and i might be wrong on that but my impression is that in the in in 1880 it's marx and engels and the farg and that because and the, the Gezdis kind of take up that and that seemed to work and it's got some traction and i think you know pakanov it spoke french was you know, i think he was in france a lot as well i think you know there, there's there's all these kind of cross fertilizations and influences and we've had this discussion before i don't think the while i agree with you that engels was right and said this is an error if it's not corrected it can blow up to all proportions all i would say is i don't think that's the sole thing or this and I, i'm sure you'd agree with me it's not like you know what i mean it's not the sole reason why the spd ended up where it did it was one symptom of a more general malaise and luxembourg picks up on that really well in 1910 in my opinion and she shows the hypocrisy of 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 kautsky and others in, in, on this question where as i say kautsky was a, you know, a leading authority on the republican issue in 1905 at the the international congress in amsterdam in 1904 against the french the french republican republican socialists and um but i so it, it's the more general thing of the, the the what i mean by original sin is it doesn't all come back to this but yes clearly Engels was right on the, the fundamental thing and that mistake was not 
uh, openly corrected, but it was it was in the it was more clearly expressed in in the in the Russian Russian program, absolutely. But the structure and everything is here. You can go and look at them. They're, they're, the, the the documents are informed by the same approach, and I think that's a that's a powerful approach. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm, I'm I'm pleased that that, that Ben is is um, making some some move towards a, a program. However, the, 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 the whole thing seems to be that, that uh, we don't need a program. We, we need two programs, two totally separate programs, uh, in, in fact, uh, a maximum program and a minimum program. And we got this at the, the Communist University as well, where, where people told us uh, quite well, what we need to do is we, we need to start from what's necessary, from what we need, and not from what's possible. Well, I have an outrageous suggestion to make. What about linking what is possible with what is necessary? And to do that, you must put forward transitional demands. Now, this is not an idea that simply an idea that Trotsky came up with out of the top of his head in 1938. This was, in fact, the central theme of the Third Congress of the Common Term, the Communist International. This is what they discussed in great detail, uh, transitional demands to link what was necessary with what was possible. So you had reformist demands that workers put forward. Uh, you you, you uh, supported those demands in the sense that, that when workers won, won small demands, then this would give them the, 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 the strength to fight for more, if getting little, then they ask for more. So, so the 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 whole notion of the of the um, transitional demands was 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 central to the to the to the Bolshevik Revolution itself. Of course, the maximum uh, you you put forward the maximum program, as you call it, uh, uh, in a revolutionary situation. But revolutionary situations are not situations that last all the time. They are very rare events in the in 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 in, uh, in 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 the in the class struggle. There was a revolutionary situation in October uh, 1917, uh, and and putting forward the, the the maximum demands for overthrowing the capitalist state uh, and seizing power by the by 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 the working class. Uh, that was the correct demand then. Nevertheless, they, they, they still retained some transitional demands. They still retained the, the, the Constituent Assembly until it exposed itself, uh, 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 eventually exposed itself by, by uh, early 1918 uh, as being part of the, um, of the counter-revolution. And, 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 and at that point, it, it was suppressed correctly uh, in favor of the rule of the Soviet. Uh, as as for the the Engels mistake, the, the Engels mistake back then was was the the mistake of the um, of the Red Republicans, uh, and and that mistake was 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 very very clearly repudiated uh, as a consequence of the uh, Paris Commune of uh, uh, eighteen seventy one. In fact, the the only the the single uh, uh, correction to the communist manifesto is that exact point that the capitalist state could not be taken over by the parties of the working class the capitalist state had to be smashed that was the 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 the, <clears throat> the, the only correction that they made to the to the uh, to, to 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 that um to that communist manifesto so so now we have a, a have a situation where, where, where we have uh, uh, um, demands for for uh, um, a, a republican Britain. The only point for the demand for a republican Britain, because we, in order to make the revolution in Britain, it's going to be the same as making the revolution in France or the same as the making the revolution in state, you, you will have to overthrow that state. However, there is a progressive feature in demanding the abolition of the monarchy, because if you demand the abolition of the monarchy, you've got to demand the abolition of the House of Lords, 
And if you demand the abolition of the monarchy and the House of Lords, then you're going to question immediately, well, where is the British constitution? No, sorry, we don't have a constitution. Well, shouldn't we have a constitution now that we've abandoned the, 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 the monarchy and the House of Lords? And of course, you'd, you, you'd have demands for cons a constitu constituent assemblies uh, and, and, and demand, uh, all that sort of thing, which, which would raise fundamental questions about the nature of the the nature of the state itself uh, um, of course the, the 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 monarchy plays very little role in 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 politics but it could conceivably play a very uh, uh repressive role if we had a a a police state which is threatening by all those that that legislation that the tories are, are going out um the police state uh uh, and then the Privy Council would, would of course, be, be one of those instruments or maybe the central instrument in, 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 that, uh, in that type of a, of a police state. But, but um, the, the, the division between the, the, the maximum programme and the minimum programme was, of course, uh, the social democratic division. The, 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 uh, the minimum program was what you fought for right now, some Mickey Mouse reforms that you could get under the capitalist system. Uh, and and the, the, the maximum program was, 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 was socialism. Uh, uh, and and uh, what you needed then was, was that, that to understand that, that socialism would come in its own good time of its own volition, right? It, it, it would arrive objectively. Uh, so, so, so you, 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 you had an objectivist uh, uh, maximum program, and it didn't really need uh, such an outrageous thing as the storming of the Winter Palace uh, and the abolition of the democracy for the bourgeoisie and their political parties. It didn't need any of that ridiculous uh, dictatorship of the proletariat stuff. What we needed is extreme democracy of the bourgeois type, and that would bring us our socialism, uh, which I really don't think anybody seriously believes anymore. Anyway, thank you for that. You're, you're, you're muted, Tina. Sorry. Thank you, Jerry. Ben, do you want to go? Uh, yes, uh, I mean, th th there's a few questions of kind of like language and and maybe maybe misunderstandings, etc. But you know, I would argue that a program has to determine uh, has to base itself on what what is, uh, what is necessary, and yes, what is what is possible, right? What we can what we can achieve, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 without kind of uh, um, being utopian or whatever about it, right? The we and and I think that the the way in which Jerry. Um, it's it's a paradox because on the one hand, Jerry attacks the SPD for um, you know uh, Mickey Mouse reforms, minimum de demands such as the the arming of the people, the abolition of the standing army, uh, universal suffrage for everyone, which by the way led to one is one of the things that led to the collapse of the Kaiser State in 1918, right, including women. Um, but then on the other hand, says, well, look. That, so, so on the one hand, they've got this reformist fuddy-duddy program, so-called, but then on the other hand says, well, but you only really raise your, what he calls the maximum program, i.e. working class rule, what he, I think he means by working class rule and socialism in revolutionary times and periods. Uh, with the possible exception of the monarchy, because it opens up certain things. No, again, th the idea that that is somehow the, the experience of uh, Bolshevism or the Russian Revolution is just, it, it, it beggars belief. I mean, because precisely what uh, Gil and I were talking about in terms of the, the the framework that the RSDLP program was fighting for, the abolition of the monarchy, the arming of the people, the dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry, the revolutionary peasantry, et cetera, right? That's precisely what they did, not just in 1905, not just in 1917, but in the midst of the Stolypin re reaction, in the midst of World War One, it's also true of what the SPD did. Actually, right? It's not that the, the, this their their guiding revolutionary ideas for a new 
social form based on the minimum program, the culmination of this demand, was something you'd find in newspapers. People would go to jail for it, right? So they had this thing where if you're an editor of uh, an SPD newspaper, they would deliberately choose young people who had no uh, family or property or anything like that because they would be constantly in and out of jail. And if they had money, <laughs> be take their assets would be seized. So you have this real thing of local, local editors being constantly pulled in for making arguments like, yes, we should have... Uh, we should get rid of the three-tier suffrage in Prussia, right? That was seen as treasonous, right? Um, but that's not something, they didn't wait until 1910 when people were mobilizing around the question of democracy in in um, in Prussia to say, hey, do you know what? We've got this program and actually what we're for is for a completely new state. This is actually the point, paradoxically, that Luxembourg is making against Kautsky in 1910, right? Is that we are not raising our political program the whole thing, not you know, not the Mickey Mouse uh, uh, reforms, but our whole political approach. We are not raising that uh, at all times, and that's leading to a political rot and political uh, uh, um, confusion, not just amongst the working class, but amongst our own people, right? And I think that's the the issue. You're quite right about transitional demands coming from. They actually come from Germany in the uh, that's, a, that's called a socialist republic. Well, look again, it's it, it's it's about terminology, Jerry, right? But fundamentally, if you want to call it the socialist republic, call it the socialist republic. But the entire point of the the if let, let's call it the socialist republic for the sake of argument so you know just put it to one side so we're speaking the same language right that is precisely what the spd minimum program was about and engels criticizes that program for precisely not making that the, the point that this is actually the aim that we want right and that republic fits then nicely into it's not two separate programs it opens up the transition to the maximum program that's the point and again so you talk about the the failure of the red 1848ers you should join my Patreon, uh, Jerry, a couple of quid a month. You can have a look. Franz Mehring, I translated his article against Rosa Luxemburg, makes exactly the same point. He says, look, all this stuff about the Republic is a legacy of Marx's republicanism in 1848. And Luxembourg absolutely destroys him. She says, she says, look, this idea that this republicanism is, is something for 1848 and the bygone, and now, now it's the socialist revolution and not some, you know, it's just, it was a cover for, it was a leftist sounding argument, right, for Mehring's rightism, where he's defending Kautsky in 1910 in the pages of Die Neue Zeit, saying, what's all this stuff about the Republic? Don't you realize that Kautsky, that, 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 uh, um, Marx got rid of his Republican superstitions, et cetera, et cetera, right? You're right that we that the the, 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 the the one major correction in the Communist Manifesto is to the abolition of, uh, to, to smash the state suppression, right? Which is a term that, come, that Lenin says is never found in German social democracy, but hey, we found it uh, in, in some of Kautsky's writings. You're right to say that, but that doesn't, that's not a different approach to the one taken in Erfurt, in Heinfeld, and in Brussels in 1903, where the RSDLP finally agrees its program, right? So I think partly it's a question of, of language sometimes in the way that we, that we speak to each other, but it's also a question of, I think, you know, questioning one's own, uh, one's own beliefs and looking at the material and thinking, oh, okay, that's quite interesting. What does that reveal uh, um, about what we want to do? Thank you. Raymond. Yeah. Um, republicanism goes way back in the history of the human race. At one time, the Romans had kings, and then there was a republic, and they replaced that with an emperor. The French did exactly the same in the 18th century. And here in Britain, we were probably the first European power in the modern age to get rid of our monarchy and become a Republican country for a brief period, I think it was 16 years. And then uh, the monarchy came back. And I really believe that there's no such thing as permanency in politics. And that argument about Republicanism and monarchy and how it's coming ebbed and flowed through time as a case in point. Arguing about democracy, let's put it in, uh, in the balance. At the moment, it's probably the hardest battle to win in politics, the battle for democracy, because at no other time in human history have we been faced by such a powerful media in the hands of a tiny minority and actually global powerful capitalists that have never existed at the time of the Erfurt program, Marx, Engels, and all the rest of it. And I really believe that that Marxist idea 
that once an idea has gripped the masses, it becomes a force for material change, will probably never exist in countries like Britain, France and Germany, because that idea will not be allowed to grip the masses, and the mass media will work their damnest to ensure it doesn't. And if the Corbyn project failure tells us anything, it tells us that that power, even restricted to what, a couple of dozen news hacks writing a weekly column in a newspaper, a couple of programmes every day on the television screen, some... Uh, <laughs> Some rumours started by his own bloody backbenchers. No armaments, no shooting, no mass strikes. Some good mass meetings, demonstrations, that achieved nothing. Achieved nothing. We're further back than we ever were in 2050. That's the power of our ruling class. That's the weakness of our democracy. And I'd like to ask Ben some questions in terms of the historic line. The minimum maximum program. To my simple mind, a party's minimum program would be the program that allowed them to take office. They would win an election. The maximum program would be the party's program once they take in power. They've consolidated a proletarian de democracy dictatorship, call it what you will. And I'd like you to try and trace that sort of these concepts through. Gramsci's war of position and war of movement that I see as the, just a debate between tactics and strategy. And I would think a minimum programme is your tactics and your maximum programme is your strategy. So I'd like you to maybe remark on that historical lineage between the terminology, as well as the major points about the failure of Corbynism and where democracy is at the moment. Interesting question. Thank you, Raymond. Um, we have only six minutes left. I suggest that we take Paul um, as the last speaker now as well, and then you can reply to both if that's okay. Hi, Paul. Hi, thank you, Ben, for a very interesting talk. And mm -hmm. I've learned a lot tonight and I've really enjoyed listening to your contributions and uh, your contributions of other people. I've got a, a couple of questions. Um, you may mentioned the differences that exist between the the method of uh, used behind the Airfoot program and maybe the method that uh, Trotsky used is in the transitional program. And I wonder if you could say something uh, more about that, and in particular. You touched on the differences that exist between the two um, uh, programs. Um, I just wondered if you thought there were any common elements there, any both concerned with transition from that's quite clear from transition from uh, from uh, capitalism to socialism. Um, but I was just wondering if you, you, you know, might have some thoughts on that. And the second, I, mean, I think, is we've been touching on this, and that is what what would a a program look like for a you know for a, a Marxist party with a mass working class membership? Um, would it look more like uh, the Airfoot program, or more like Trotsky's program, or uh, would there need to be some kind of super set of uh, past programs? that retain the rational and um, progressive elements of those programs and ditch the stuff that's no longer rational or uh, no longer relevant. Um, I mean, you mentioned, you know, the difference there between Trotsky and um, other socialists about the emphasis he places on leadership rather than consciousness. It seems to me that obviously if you have leadership, you need the, the necessary conditions that um, are, are dialectically related, uh, that um, that um, you know, leadership depends on consciousness, and consciousness depends on le leadership. So there's the two elements there. Um, anyway, but I'll just leave those two questions. What are the, if any, other common elements between the effort and Trotsky's program, and 
what would a program look like in the here and now? Well, that, that sounds like a really good answer to um, a question to answer in the summing up as well. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Raymond. I think I start with uh, Raymond. Um, maybe just a, a chiming in on the point you made, but also maybe one uh, distinction. I think I need to bring out clearer, or maybe hadn't explained very well. Um, yeah, the global media moguls. I mean, don't underestimate though. You know, the, the influence of the media of newspapers in in Kaiserreich Germany. You know, there, there was also uh, newspaper cartelization. You had people, especially in later on in Weimar. Um, you know, uh, uh, the the Hugenberg Press, you know, was was a was a huge uh, enterprise right wing uh, outfit, and uh, you know the the, the it, 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 so it's not just now that we have a monopoly over media uh, of production and ownership. I agree with you that it's that it's crazy now, but I think that's one of the things you know in, in terms of lessons of Corbynism to the extent that we can draw them is. The, the, it's something that the effort program and the SPD got right is that you need your own media, right? The, you you can't, you know, and it needs to be even in conditions of illegality, right? One of the things that kept the uh, the party together during the conditions of illegality was producing a newspaper in Switzerland and smuggle it in in newspapers. That's one of the things that Clara, uh, sorry, that smuggle it in, in. I'm getting tired. One uh, smuggling it in in, in suitcases. That's what uh, uh, Clara Zetkin did for a few years from Swiss from uh, from Switzerland. Right, it's the the, the 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 need for one's own independent media, and you know, you look at the SPD. I don't know how much you know about the history room, but you know, there's a hundred daily publications, magazines for doctors, magazines for teachers, magazines for sports, magazines for children, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was a whole counter press, which I think is that's the real indictment. I think one of the indictments of the left is how poor its press is. Uh, uh, how, how how unambitious it is, and uh, you know, uh, largely unreadable as well. But it's also this reliance. There is this idea now that we can rely on, you know, YouTube or social or Twitter or something as that. That's the kind of way out of it. You know, the kind of Paul Mason thing in the past. Um, and no, we we need our own YouTube. We need our own, uh, you know, the, uh, social media platforms and all the rest of it. That's what we should aspire to, I think. And I think, you know, I, I'm sure we agree on that. And I chime in. Um, the, uh, I agree with Jerry here in the chat, by the way, there is a difference between taking office and taking power. And that's worth uh, underlining in terms of the context of these debates. The, the minimum program is demands. Those are the minimum that would be required for the SPD to take power. What exact form that would take is different, but it wouldn't just be coming into like some fresh French socialists argue for wouldn't be forming a government within the framework of the French Third Republic, right? It would be actually coming to power and and, and completely uh, dissolving those those uh, those institutions of rule. So I think there's a difference between taking office and taking power. And too often in the 20th century, the left has taken power, often in minority regimes, and basically been constricted by those existing power structures, uh, either to then that they come at, uh, become adapted to it and and uh, and become those uh, institution, or they're unable to do anything meaningful and are voted out the next time that there the, 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 the were elections. So I think that's a, that's an important distinction to make. And I, you know, for all my disagreements with Jerry, I, I agree with him on that. There's a difference between taking office and taking power. Um, yeah, the, 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 on Paul's questions, um, the difference between the, the method of, of the effort program and the Trotskyist program feeding off Jerry's point about the third Congress of the Comintern, I think, you know, this again, I've spoken on this on several occasions uh, in terms of the history of the Comintern, the German Communist Party. There are a lot of decisions made. The idea of the transitional demand that comes from Germany, right, is basically in a situation where you have a Communist Party that for various reasons is clearly marginalized and in a minority in the in the organized conscious working class movement of germany huge movement right and it's trying to find ways in a, in a very short term uh, manner of gaining leadership over the workers for example that would vote spd so there is this emphasis on if we put forward demands united front work etc cetera, etc cetera, we can show that we're the best fighters we can win demands and then the, the 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 workers will often come towards us and they'll want more as well right 
and that's informed by 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 a healthy uh, a healthy um uh, drive but i think it's reflective of a commentary that is actually in trouble right and that the russian revolution's in trouble the german communist party is is in all sorts of uh, problems as well right and it doesn't fundamentally address the, uh, the 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 more fundamental point of working class revolutionary organization and party organization so the 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 minimum uh, sorry the, the transitional demands are trying to address that 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 uh, that lacuna in a kind of uh, short-termist way, I was tr- still trying to move on the German Revolution. We're trying to grow the Communist Party, and that's one of the ways we can do it. Right with Trotsky, it's a similar thing, but it's trying to win over uh, workers that are uh, that been that under the influence not only of social democracy but of Stalinism. And it, and Jerry quite outlined it quite quite well. Actually, it's the idea that if we focus on existing struggles that are you know that were raging at the time, and Trotsky was of the view that. The, the world bourgeoisie is, I think he puts it in the in the introduction, uh, tobogganing towards uh, doom and crisis. Right in the in that context, uh, we can feed into those struggles. The masses will want more, and almost by the very nature of those struggles, they will be they will come round to our point of view, and we will give them a, an alternative leadership, right, a revolutionary leadership as opposed to the sellouts of the SPD. Uh, and the sorry social democracy and and Stalinist and clearly there's 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 an element to that but what I think is lost then and has been lost it's a very complicated process and there are all different types of transitional uh, programs as as Jerry would tell us um, but essentially what that has left that has led to in my opinion is a kind of soft peddling of the uh, the fundamental tenets of alternative constitutional politics high politics that characterize Marxism right often with good intentions, but we've ended up with a situation where, yeah, you have someone like Jerry who will say, look, in Britain today, the monarchy is not that powerful. OK, it's a good slogan, etc. But only in revolutionary situations do we put forward these bigger ideas, etc. And I would argue, and again, it's informed by that logic, right? Because when when things speed up, right, in terms of revolution, in terms of struggles and strikes and all the rest of it, that's when f- for Jerry and, and other Trotskyists, that's their time to come in with the right transitional demands that reflect the present and lead the revolution that way away from existing organization but the problem with that is and i would argue history the 20th century shows particularly in germany that it's the absence of a revolutionary constitutional political alter- alternative uh that if, if it only gets put forward then in the, in the midst of january 1919 in the in the, in the the death throes of a revolution it's already bloody too late and by a long way right so that that i think is the is is the is the point is that sometimes these discussions seem esoteric and you know certainly with me very historical and and you know centered on german speaking sources etc but it it's about that idea that you know in order to become a mass organization with a following uh that is different from existing bourgeois parties as Kautsky makes the point you need a clear programmatic political alternative which is often lacking for good reasons right that turn out to be wrong in things like the transitional program where these things tend to be played down we do not start with existing struggles as revolutionary or whatever as they may be we start with where are we and what is our political alternative and i think that is something that we can take warts and all from from the airfoot program look back critically but also understand what it was truly about thank you Excellent. thank you very much it's also of course about the working class taking all these issues seriously because we want the working class to become the ruling class if it doesn't know anything about you know how the monarchy works if it doesn't develop that that side of things or you know have the house of lords etc all these things i mean these are the questions that we want the working class to take on and take over isn't it so we have to not leave it for some time later but for the here and now it needs to become a to develop political class that has an interest in everything, every single bloody issue here and now, and not just you know the wages and you know okay nationalize this or that. It's that's not the answer, is it? We have to we have to have a deep understanding of how capitalism works so that we can overthrow it. Thank you very much, Ben. Fantastic sessions, really good discussion as well. Thank you, comrades, for all your um, good questions and contributions ben you must be knackered <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah really just to say sorry if i sorry if i haven't replied to all the chat stuff as well i will save it but you can yeah i, I put the slides you can reach me if you want to write me uh, questions but i will try and have a look at it all but it's, it's quite tough when you're in the middle of it
Very much so. Thank you very much, comrade. Next week, we're looking at democratic centralism, which will be another huge important issue with uh, Kevin Bean, introduction by Kevin Bean. So he's looking at uh, democratic centralism during the Social Democratic Party, uh, late 19th century. And then this is something I'm really interested in, really looking forward to is when we're coming to the end of this sub-series at the end of November, we're starting to look at the history of the Middle East, the history of Palestine, Israel, that situation, how it's developed um, since the Ottoman Empire, etc. And what we, you know, to understand actually what's going on, properly understand it and what we can do about it and how, where the solution lies, etc. Because it's it's um, it is complicated. It's not as complicated as some people make it make it out. Um, you know, the bad sides, the bad, bad apples on both sides. No, but the, to understand the history of the oppression uh, that's been going on for some time, it's really important to to get to grips of it properly. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, so, but I uh, hope to see lots of you next week when Kevin Bean, as I said, will be starting to look at democratic centralism. Thank you very much, Ben, for an excellent session. Good night, comrades.